<laughs> How's it going lads? Welcome back to the garage. In today's video, we're gonna be comparing and contrasting wooden bodied planes with metal bodied planes. Now for the longest time, humanity has been using wooden bodied planes like this fella here to plane all our wood. Archaeologists have even found wooden planes very similar to this fella in front of me on ancient Roman sites. Now they can vary in size from big large jointer planes to little smoothing planes, but they all pretty much follow the same design principles. They all have a mortise cut through the body of the plane that comes out of the sole here, you can see the mouth. And then there's the iron that does the actual cutting and that's held in place with a wedge here. Now they're a very simple plane to adjust. Uh, if you just want to take out the iron, you just... That'll also retract the iron, but if you hit it hard enough, the whole thing will come apart like that. And then you can slide it back into place. Uh, and usually you'd eyeball how far down the mouth you want it to come. Uh, and once you're happy with it, you can just do all your adjustment then with a little, I have a little pin hammer here that I use it for it. They're almost always bedded at around 45 degrees. Sometimes you can get high angles or low angles, but generally speaking, the majority of them will be around 40, 45 degrees. So every carpenter would have had planes just like these up until around about the 1860s when a man called Leonard or Leonard Bailey came up with this pattern. So this is the Bailey pattern of plane and anyone who's ever done any sort of woodworking is familiar with these. They come in all sorts of different sizes from the incy wincy number one all the way up to the massive number eight jointer plane. But this fella here in front of me is the number five. Not long after he had come up with the Bailey pattern, Stanley actually purchased the patent and they've been producing planes just like this fella ever since. So after Stanley started mass producing them, the wooden plane kind of went out of style and now you see these absolutely everywhere in old sheds, old garages, just any old car boot sale, you're bound to bump into a few of these, usually in poor condition, but they were so well designed that they can be fixed up very easily if you just remove the rust, give the handles a bit of oil and clean them up and sharpen the blade, usually the plane will go again. Unfortunately for the wooden ones, when they get neglected, uh, woodworm gets to them, they can rot and generally they become a lost cause, so you actually don't see too many wooden planes anymore. So that's just a very brief history. In today's video, we're gonna be comparing and contrasting the two types, so stay tuned. Now to make this a fair comparison, the first thing we're gonna do is just sharpen the two planes just so they're both as sharp as each other so that none of them has an advantage that way. So we just pop the iron out there and we're just gonna use our screwdriver here, pull out the iron. I have a diamond stone here and we're gonna give this fella a quick sharpen before we bring it onto the whetstone. Now with a lot of the older planes, you can see on the iron that it's stamped, uh, this fella stamped made in Sheffield. Some of the steel that Sheffield was producing in the past was just unbelievably high quality stuff. Could really hold its edge and wouldn't go blunt quickly. So I was just soaking this whetstone there for a while, but we gotta make sure it is perfectly flat. So we can just use our diamond stone for that there by placing it on top of it and just rubbing them together for a while. A good test of the flatness is to see if they stick to each other and they do. So we'll um, slide it off set it to the side, grab our iron one more time and just give it a quick, quick sharpen. So that's an 8,000 grit whetstone as well for anyone wondering. Totally overkill, I don't think you need to go that high at all but you know I have the stone so I might as well use it. And now there's a bit of hair after growing back in our arm so yeah we give it a quick test and it seems to be just flying right off. We put back on the chip breaker. The chip breaker is what sits on top of the other side of the plane iron and when the shavings get cut into it, the chip breaker kind of uh, it breaks them. It kind of crunches them up and stops tear out from happening. So I lined it up there now about a millimeter from the edge and just lock her home good and tight. I have a piece of southern yellow pine in here then that I'm just going to chuck into the vise. Now I'm just going to slide it into the wooden plane there now. I'm just going to use the big mallet here to drive the wedge shut. And you can see there now we are taking way too thick a shaving so we're just gonna retract the iron a bit so now we're not taking any shaving anymore another thing you can do is just close one eye and look down along the sole of the plane all the while hitting the back of the iron with the hammer here and when you can kind of see it poke its head up into the sole then you know you've gone far enough so i have it going here now taking a nice clean shaving along the wood so I'm happy we have this fella set up. So I'm happy now that the wooden one is ready to go. Uh, the number five is probably already sharp enough to begin with, but uh, to be fair, I'll uh, sharpen the two of them. The irons on the Stanley is a lot thinner, like the one uh, we just sharpened there on the wooden one. It's very kind of thick iron, whereas this fella, I'd say it's only about a millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters thick. So same old story. We're gonna bring it up to the whetstone here, give it a quick sharpen. 
Right, I've run out of hair on that arm, but we give this fella a test here, and yeah, the hairs are just flying off. Another thing I should mention about the wooden ones is that you kind of have to be careful when putting the iron in. If the iron touches off the wooden body in the wooden plane, it's not going to do it any harm, but if you, if you put the edge against a piece of metal, that's going to blunt on it, like, so you just have to be careful when you're putting it back in. Lock her into place. And geez, yeah, that was nearly perfect already. Maybe we can just adjust it a small bit. But yeah, looks like we have the two of them nearly ready to go. Now, obviously, the first comparison you can make is the fact that they're entirely different materials, and that'll mean there'll be a bit of a difference in the weight. I weighed both of them. The metal-bodied one is about 1.9 kg, whereas the wooden fella here is only about 1.4. So it's not that big of a difference, but if we're using a plane for a long time, having the lighter plane will probably mean you'll be able to go at it for a bit longer. It probably doesn't make that big a difference uh, for a small jack plane like this fella, but let's say you were using a jointer plane for a few hours uh, to get a big table flat or something like that, then that's really gonna make a difference. I have a wooden triplane here that I haven't tuned in quite some time now. You can see there, plenty of dust on it, but this is gonna be significantly lighter than let's say uh, Stanley number eight, which we have down here somewhere. Now this scales can only weigh up to two kg, but even just by feeling the two of these, it's just day and night, the weight difference. You can see there now, they're nearly about the same length. That's one advantage, I suppose, of using the wooden ones over the metal ones, is the fact that they're a bit lighter. Now we briefly talked about it earlier, but adjusting a plane is fairly important. If you want to take big meaty cuts when you're dimensioning down planks of wood, you want to be able to knock the iron in good and deep and then just start shaving away bigger chunks. And then let's say you want to do a bit of smoothing and you want to get a real nice thin shaving. You want to be able to knock it back easily. Now, once you get used to the wooden ones, it's not that difficult to do, but it does take a lot of getting used to. Whereas for adjusting a metal body plane, so we can easily adjust the iron with this adjustment knob back here, which if you're just starting out with woodworking, it's actually very easy to tune and set one of these up. Whereas if you're just kind of getting started, these fellas take a bit of getting used to. Another very big difference with the metal ones that definitely gives them a distinct advantage is the lateral adjuster, which is this fella up here above the iron. You can see myself twisting it there now. So that basically rocks the iron from left to right. So we can just adjust to take more of a shaving on this side, or we can twist it the other way to make more of a shaving on the other side. It's fast, it's quick, it's easy. Whereas for the wooden planes, you have to turn them on their sides and actually hit the iron from side to side. And it's just a bit more difficult. Again, it's more getting used to. So, so definitely for adjusting, the metal bodied planes are far superior than their wooden counterparts. Durability is another big thing. I talked at the start about how these fellas can uh, rot away over time, but also a problem that I have encountered with a lot of the older ones is that the sole, it being made of wood, constantly rubbing against other wood, the sole actually wears away. So that can be a bit of a problem uh, because when it wears away the sole, the mouth gradually gets bigger and bigger. And when the mouth is too big, the plane doesn't work as effectively. Now, in order to fix the sole, you can get a big slab of granite I have down here alongside of me and get a bit of sandpaper and lap the whole sole perfectly flat. But you are going to run out of sole a lot quicker than on the metal ones. Now, over time, the metal soles can go out of flat and you also have to pull out your granite slab and lap but the good thing is you don't have to do it anywhere near as often. I lapped the number eight in the last video and that'll probably be good to go for pretty much ever decades. I won't have to lap that sole again. Whereas this fella, I'm probably gonna have to lap in a few years. I also might uh, cut out a piece here and put in a new mouth to make it a bit more closed. And that's a bit of work, a bit more maintenance. So the wooden ones really just aren't as durable. The metal ones are incredibly durable. I'm sure I have one somewhere uh, from it's 19, it's 130 years old, so it's from the 1890s, it's a number four. Yeah, this fella here, it's an old number four now. Beautiful little plane. It's building up a bit of surface rust actually, which is a shame. You kind of have to constantly maintain them. Just, I have a bit of scotch bright here, and you just constantly rub them, make sure the surface rust isn't building up on it. But that just gives you a good idea, like these planes, if looked after, can last forever. And sometimes these planes are neglected for very long periods of time. And all you have to do is just come back to them, remove all the rust, give the handles a bit of oil maybe, lap off all the rust, get the sole nice and flat again, and then you have a perfectly functional plane once more. With the wooden ones, there is a pile of wooden ones behind me that are just gone beyond repair. The reason I hang on to them is because they have nice steel in them, so I might repurpose them at some point. But yeah, for durability and uh, longevity, 
has to be the metal ones. One other thing I should mention about durability is that if you drop either of the two planes, the wooden one will fare a lot better than the metal one. If you drop the wooden one, uh, if it falls onto concrete, it'll probably just get a dent. If it falls onto wood, it'll probably be entirely fine. Um, if this fella falls onto wood, it'll also probably be okay. But if it falls onto concrete, that's what I'm standing on right now, there's a good chance it'll crack and break. So I suppose if you're clumsy and you're constantly dropping things, maybe a wooden one is for you. The weakest point on any plane is like this part here. Uh, oftentimes when you do see them uh, at markets and stuff, this is where they're just cracked and broken. So if you are looking to buy a plane and they're charging you, if it's cheap, buy it anyway, because it might be good for parts. But if they're charging a lot for it and you still want to buy it, just make sure you check for little hairline cracks along the sole here, especially if there's rust, maybe kind of wipe it away and take a good close look. Another thing worth noting about the wooden ones is that they can expand and contract with moisture levels. Let's say, for example, it starts lashing rain outside and a load of moisture comes into the air. Uh, this plane will actually swell and it'll swell more at the ends uh, than in the middle, just because it's easier for moisture to go into the end grain. So. so to prevent this, you can seal it with oil or wax, but even still, you're going to get some movement. It's not a massive deal, but it can be a bit annoying when you have a plane set absolutely perfectly. Another worthwhile comparison is money. How much do these things cost? Now, I was very lucky. I found this in a big pile of old tools that I paid 28 euro for. So this probably worked out maybe two or three euro for me. And you could probably buy it on the likes of eBay or something like that for maybe like uh, 20, 30 euros, which is pretty cheap. A nice Stanley number no. five like this will probably cost you around 70 or 80 euros here anyway in Ireland. In America, which is where a lot of you are watching, you can get them fairly cheap. There's a lot more planes on the market there, so that kind of brings down the price. But generally speaking, these things are kind of harder to find in like um, piles of tools because people know what they are. They know they're worth something. A decent vintage Bailey pattern plane will probably set you back around about 70 quid. Uh, now, there are higher end ones that you can buy nowadays, like Lee Nielsen and Veritas. I think they're for around three or 400 euro. They're very nice planes. I haven't got one yet, but maybe someday. For me personally, I pretty much exclusively use metal planes. I do like to pull out the wooden ones the odd time just because they're it's kind of satisfying tuning them up, especially a Japanese plane that I was gifted recently. This fella has lovely Japanese steel in it. It takes an absolutely beautiful cut altogether, and that's made out of oak. But again, that's kind of just more of a plane to use because it's fun, not because I need to do something. For 99% of my planing, I'm using a number five. You can set the plane really deep if you need to take good chunky cuts, really thin if you want to smooth it. You can also kind of use it as a jointer plane for jointing together a few boards once they're not too long or large. To conclude, the metal bodied planes have a much more important place in contemporary woodworking than the wooden ones. That being said, I think it's important to kind of appreciate the history. Planes like this served humanity very well for literally thousands of years, so it's cool to have a living piece of history in your toolbox. As hand tools have become more and more obsolete over the last hundred years, it is kind of cool to hang on to these pieces of history. A lot of woodworkers today get by without any plane whatsoever. They can do everything with an electric planer. So I suppose anyone who's holding on to the traditional ways would probably appreciate having one of these anyway. So if you can find one, nice and cheap, pick it up, get it going for yourself, throw it up on a shelf if nothing else, and enjoy it. Sound for watching, and I'll talk to you again in the next one. Good luck.